Hey there, my name is Megan and welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be doing a spoiler-free review for Blackwing by Ed McDonald. But before we go ahead and get on into the review, if you are not already subscribed to my channel, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button as well as the little bell icon so you can be notified every time I post new bookish content. I post new content every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday, and sometimes other days throughout the week. Also, don't forget to check down in the description box for links to all of my social media, my buddy Ray Discord, and my Patreon, where you can be entered into winning book giveaways. The way that I structure my reviews is I talk about the plot, the world, the characters, the things that I liked and the things that I didn't like, and then I give the book an overall rating. If you're interested in just skipping to any one of those particular sections, I will put timestamps down below. The Republic faces annihilation, despite the vigilance of Galhero's black wings. When a raven tattoo rips itself from his arm to deliver a desperate message, Gauhero and a mysterious noblewoman must investigate a long-dead sorcerer's legacy. But there is a conspiracy within the Citadel. Traitors, flesh eaters, and ghosts of the wasteland seek to destroy them. But if they cannot solve the ancient wizard's paradox, the Deep Kings will walk the earth again, and all will be lost. The war with the Eastern Empire ended in stalemate some 80 years ago, thanks to Nal's engine, a wizard-crafted weapon so powerful even the Deep Kings feared it. The strike of the engine created the Misery, a wasteland full of ghosts and corrupted magic that now forms a no-man's land along the frontier. But when Galhero investigates a frontier fortress, he discovers complacency bordering on treason. Then the walls are stormed and the engine fails to launch. Galhero only escapes because of the pre-natural magic power of a noblewoman he was supposed to be protecting. Together, they race to the capital to unmask the traitors and restore the Republic's defenses. Far across the misery, a vast army is on the move as the Empire prepares to call the Republic's bluff. I personally found the world that Ed McDonald created incredibly fascinating. So it's definitely very bleak. This war between the Deep Kings and the humans has just created this desolate part of the land where there's cracks in the sky, there's cracks in the earth, and all of these kind of mutated magical creatures live there. And it's very dangerous for humans to travel into. And if they do, they can actually feel the magic. And our main character who has to travel to, it's known as the Misery, has to travel to the Misery to do certain jobs, always talks about how the magic, he can feel the magic, taste the magic, it affects him, it gives him the shakes, and I just found that really, really cool, a really cool concept. The author created a bunch of different magical beings also that I found really fascinating. So the main one that definitely creeped me out were the darlings, and the darlings masquerade as children, but they're definitely not children. And the darlings are completely brutal beings, they will kill you, they will control you, and our main character has interactions with the darlings and just describes the feeling of the darlings controlling his mind and getting into his mind. So just killer evil children looking things definitely creepy and then we have if I remember correctly they're called the drudges oh gosh I can't remember now but they are almost like these I want to say zombie like beings but don't think of like complete insane zombies but they are men that have been captured by the enemy and changed by the enemy in order to become these emotionless kind of husk of a soldier that just does whatever the Deep Kings tell them to and they just attack. So we do have war in this book between our humans, the kingdom, and the Deep Kings and they use these soldiers as the front lines and their army. We also have different types of like magicians. So we do have uh, sorcerers and sorceresses. Our main noblewoman named Elizabeth is a sorceress. She's a light spinner. But then we also have another sorcerer that our main character deals with who is not a good sorcerer. And he's very unscrupulous and he does healing arts. But we actually don't know enough about him for me to really say all the different abilities that he has. But he is definitely not a good character. And then we also have these beings known as the Nameless, and the Nameless are immortals. And they are almost, I haven't yet figured out how they relate to the Deep Kings. So the Deep Kings are these immortals, they're these all-powerful wizards. And the Nameless are almost as powerful, but it takes a whole bunch of Nameless in order to take down one Deep King if they were, you know, fighting. And I haven't yet figured out, like, what the Nameless are. And they're just powerful beings that kind of keep to themselves, but they are able to fight if needed. They don't really like the humans, but if the humans needed them, they would come help. 
And our main character actually deals with one nameless in particular known as Crowfoot, and he works for him. And the way that Crowfoot contacts our main character is he has a raven tattooed into his forearm, and that is how the nameless communicates with him. Literally, this huge bird erupts from his arm and talks to him. And that's just wild to me because our main character is talking about how excruciatingly painful it is to have something erupt from your body, and then the skin just heals over in no time, and his t tattoo is back, the bird disappears, and then it happens again next time uh, Crowfoot needs to talk to him. But the main magic that revolves around this world has to do with light. So there are sorcerers known as light spinners, and they are responsible for taking moonlight and turning it into electricity. And then this electricity is used to power the engine, which is the main weapon that this kingdom has against the Deep Kings. And not only that, but a lot of this light is used to power different parts of the kingdom. And what I found really interesting is that normally in books, sorcerers and people with magical abilities are revered and respected, but light spinners aren't. They, as soon as it is found out that you have this ability, then you are basically become a slave to these light mills. And our main character goes to one of these light mills and he talks about seeing the light spinners chained to their contraption that they use to extract light. And eventually in these light mills, you are worked to death. So I just found it really ironic that the people that keep the country running with regards to electricity are the ones that are treated the worst and have this magical ability. And our main character, Ezebeth, has this magical ability. She is extremely powerful with it though, and she can do other things that other light spinners can't. And she talks about how when she first came into her power, how it physically changed her body. So it's a very potent magic, it's a very strong magic, it's a very dangerous magic, and I just found it really fascinating. The author definitely combined magic and science or magic and technology and I love when authors are able to do that and it reminded me a lot of Foundry Side by Robert Jackson Bennett. Um, Curtis Craddock Risen Kingdom series uses that as well as Anthony Ryan in his Draconis Memoria series. All of those authors are able to create these awesome technologies in their fantasy worlds that also combine magic and I absolutely love reading about that. Next we have our character. So this is a first person point of view fantasy book and we follow Ryholt. So Ryholt actually became a very complex character. So when I was first reading about him, I wasn't a huge fan of him and I really wasn't sure if he was going to be a character that I would even care about. But as the story went on and we learned more about him, I actually grew to really like him and I loved reading about his backstory and how it made him the man that he is today. I just found it really cool and well done and interesting. And Ryholt is basically a mercenary. He is hired to hunt down and kill fanatics, people who immortalize the Deep Kings and worship the Deep Kings. So he hunts them down, goes into the misery, and kills them. And he also gets hired for like odd jobs here and there. And as I said, Ryholt has a really interesting history. He was born into a noble family. He went to war. He wanted to be like a recognized war hero. He wanted to be a military leader. And things happened and definitely didn't work out for him. Um, I will say that Ryholt is definitely a very bleak person. He's very depressed. He's an alcoholic. He is not afraid to kill you or hurt you if you get in the way or if you're his target, he will definitely hurt you. So he's definitely not like a likable character per se, but then we do learn that there's a different part of him. So he actually does really care about his friends, the people that mean something to him. And he has two characters characters, the side characters, we have Nem and we have Nada who work with him. And these characters are kind of like come from the underbelly of society. They're mercenaries also. And if it wasn't for Ryholt's society probably wouldn't care about them at all. But he shows them love and compassion and we see that from him. So even though Ryholt is definitely a hardened warrior mercenary, he does have a tender side to him. And I absolutely loved how human the author made him because throughout the whole book Ryholt is constantly questioning himself should I do the right thing or could I just run away and leave you know all these people to figure out the mess for themselves so he is definitely contemplating whether or not to do the right thing all the time and I just found that really real because I feel like a lot of times in our own lives we have to ask ourselves is it worth doing the right thing should I do the right thing or would it be easier just to run and our main character was very human when it came to that so I appreciated the author giving us a character that had a lot of humanity to him 
then we have Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is a noble woman. And Rihal actually knew her when they were about 16 years old. They were actually kind of paired up to be betrothed before something happened to Elizabeth. And like I said, she is a sorceress. She's a light spinner. She's very powerful, but she's also very intelligent. And she is the one that has kind of figured out that something's going on with Nal's engine that it might not work if they try to activate it. That there's something wrong with regards to the light and the amount of light and energy that it requires to be used. So she starts doing all of these investigations. And at first, I thought that Elizabeth wasn't going to be a very interesting character. I really didn't care much for her at first, but same thing with Rihal. As we got towards the end of the book, we got to see a lot of depth with regards to her. And she's very similar to Rihal in that both of these characters are dealing with a lot of inner demons and they affect their decisions and actions in everyday life. And Elizabeth does have a big part at the end of the book that I really can't say because of spoilers, but a very big part at the end of the book that I was not expecting. And there is kind of like an open-ended ending with regards to that and how she will play into book two. So definitely wasn't expecting that twist from the author. There were a ton of things I liked about this book. So definitely the world. I found the world fascinating. I really enjoyed our characters as we got to know them and I appreciated how much depth our author gave them for such a short book. Also for the length of the book, it's only about 330 pages, the author expertly crafted a ton of political and economical intrigue that worked into the entire plot. So overall the plot was extremely well-rounded. You had everything that you could think of in a fantasy book. You had magic, you had a good world development, you had good characters, you had a romance, and you had your economic and political intrigue. So all the things that you expect to find in like an 800 page fantasy book, our author was able to put into a 300 page fantasy book. There are a couple of different themes that I really liked. So the first one was being able to forgive yourself or move on from your past. So as I said, Rihal definitely has a little bit of a tragic past. We see that and we see as the story goes on that he is able to move past that and forgive himself for what has happened. So I really liked the theme of forgiving oneself. As for the things that I didn't like, there really wasn't a ton. I will say it did take me a little while to get into the writing and the writing's not bad. In fact, there are some lines that I read in this book that I thought were beautiful and really really spoke to me but when I first started reading the book our main character is a little bit crude he uses really really crude language and he our author also writes in fragments not a ton I'm not a fan of that type of writing where you constantly write in fragmented sentences um, he does use them a lot but it's not enough for me to like not want to read it and some of the people that I was buddy reading with said that they really couldn't get into the writing and I'm all about DNFing a book if I can't get into the writing I personally didn't find it off-putting once I got through like the first couple chapters. So there was a lot of differing opinions on this book with the people that I read it with. Um, some people liked it okay. They said it was a unique fantasy book. Um, uh, Andrew over at Andrew's Wizardly Reads DNF'd it. <laughs> he said that it reminded him too much of The Black Company by Glenn Cook, which is a book that I haven't read, so I can't say. And then I also had Patrick um, say that he really was off-put even in chapter one. So it's hard for me to say if you are going to like this book. I would say if you're a fan of Mark Lawrence, Joe Abercrombie, Glenn Cook, then you would probably like this book. And I personally loved it. I gave this a four and a half out of five stars. And I can honestly say at this point, it's probably in the top five books that I've read this year. But a lot of people that I read this with did not share my opinion. I just personally loved it. Okay, you guys, that is it for my spoiler-free review for Blackwing by Ed McDonald. Let me know in the comments if you read this and what you thought of it or if you plan on reading it. And I will see you all soon in another video. Goodbye!